All right, uh, let's uh, let's go on to this one here. This is a little um, little little bit of the same, but a little different. Fifty six year old male. Uh, he was um, getting out of a canoe. He was fishing and drinking a lot. He said, um, and he fell out of his canoe and sustained this injury here. Uh, so this is what he showed up. Um, and I, you know, we kind of went through this point before. Um, any thoughts, Jan? Majorly different. I mean, this one's pretty well reduced. Um, you know, the, the talus, you can see here, the talus is centered underneath the tibia. Overall, you know, things look a little bit less dramatic than the previous case that we saw. Um, if this comes into your clinic, because a lot of times this is going to get sent out of the ER, come to the clinic, um, are you getting a stress x ray on this? No. I, I mean, I think you've already stressed it. Um, so a stress x-ray for everybody on the call is when we would sometimes do what, whether it be an external rotation stress. So we would externally rotate the foot while holding the tibia and see if we have some medial clear space widening. So right where the arrow is, uh, or not the arrow, but um, between the medial side of the talus, as well as the medial, ma medial malleolus, right where that laser pointer is. Or you could do a gravity stress where basically you just hang the patient's leg off the um, the table and they shoot an X-ray. Yeah. Um, and but I don't stress that. For me, that that shows it's it's wide enough. Um, you know, I'm usually getting a stress test when I'm looking for reasons why not to operate on somebody. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, the uh, this game, I think he came with this, but um, you can see here even more widening between yeah. the talus and the and, and, the, and the reason we're, we're always so worried about widening is because we know that if the talus is moved over, even was it one millimeter, was it 30 to 40 percent higher contact pressure or something like that? I always yeah. forget the number. Yeah, it's about it's like it's like one or two millimeters is, you know, 30 percent change in contact pressure. Yeah. So they get arthritis. And then what that means is they, they can get more rapid arthritis for some yeah. of these patients. Yeah. Um, so this is, you know, I'm going to skip. We didn't get a CT scan, if I recall. At least it's not important enough to include. If it did, it was unremarkable. Um, so this is this is a guy I was worried about. His skin, he, you know, and the first time you meet him, he doesn't seem like a super reliable individual. Um, and so I was going to approach this one just a little bit differently. So, you know, similar approach where I'm using those same clamps uh, to fix this, but I was, I went ahead and used an intramedullary nail uh, to fix this, uh, this ankle fracture. So this is kind of, I had some pretty good x-rays showing like the step-by-step -step process. Um, and so, you know, the first thing is, you know, I did make an incision. So, you know, contrary to, um, you know, what I think they'd been talked about was doing it all percutaneous, I am making an incision and putting clamps on on the fracture because I want that lined up. Um, yeah. Similar to like a subtroke or something like that is kind of how I see it. Don, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's key. So just because you use a nail or something minimally invasive does not mean a minimally invasive implant does not mean you you don't make an incision and reduce the fracture. And that goes for a tibia, goes for a femur, goes for anything like, a, like you mentioned a subtroke. Um, you still want to reduce the fracture. Uh, so I love this. I, I love uh, that you opened it, reduced it. It's anatomic. Um, so yeah, it looks great. So then, you know, your incision is going to be, you know, a little more distal, obviously, to put the intramedullary implant and, and trying to kind of get inside the tip of that fibula, um, slightly inside, because it, inevitably it's always that reamer the drill, whatever, wants to push you a little more lateral and you want to really protect that lateral bone. Um, here, I tried to say it just a little bit posterior. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, kind of just showing my starting points and then advancement of the K wire. We tried to adjust this a little bit, if I remember right, to get a little bit more posterior, but it kind of kept going in that, in that spot. So we ended up accepting that. Um, and then advancing the K-wire proximal. The other thing I'm going to point out here is if you look at how, for those who haven't seen a lot of nails, um, <coughs> if, you, if you look at um, where my clamps are, they're headed proximal, they're sitting proximal. And that's because you want to make sure you put the clamps on that way, because otherwise the jig will get in the way of, um, uh, of passing the nail. 
so you know, intermediate reamer, the kind of the you know the distal reamer followed by the more proximal reamer, and then advancing the the nail into place. Um, one of the things I want to make sure um, is that when I'm doing these, is I want to make sure that I know where my syndesmosis screws are going to sit, and then what the trajectory is going to be, because you can't um, necessarily, once you kind of get it in, you can't really adjust it that well. So, uh, that, you know, that's that's one of the things that I always am trying to really, you know, second guess and, or uh, double check as I'm going through the case. Yeah, and you know, somebody mentioned uh, or asked a question, what are the indications of nail versus plate? Mm -hmm. So uh, what are your indications? You mentioned this guy, he sounded like he was more unreliable. Um, Skin, for me right now it is um, if I have concerns about incision healing, um, you know, with, with the plate, you know, being right underneath the skin or compliance, those are probably the biggest indications, you know, that I've done. Um, I have yeah. used it in some cases where I just stick them in a boot right away and let them kind of let them walk on it, you know, and trying to stick to that, that principle, but um, of, of early motion and weight bearing. But th in this case, it was really a skin, concerned about skin healing. Right. I, I do the same thing for, for some of my neuropathic patients uh, or yeah, anybody with bad skin, usually older patients, I mean, who have very thin skin. Um, I think this is more ideal because even if you have a, some wound breakdown from where you place those clamps, well, there's no, there's no metal there. The metal is on the yeah. inside of the bone. Yeah. Yeah. So you can do dressing changes and so forth, you know, especially for diabetic patients, you know, when their hemoglobin A1C is elevated, I think these are really nice implants for that yeah. uh, type of thing. For sure. Um, and then the, I used all three distal interlocks, and, you know, this is early on. One of the things that stuck out of me on this case was how distal that syndesmosis screw was. And at first I thought maybe I left the nail a little bit proud, but when you see it a little bit, it was actually buried in the bone a little bit. I, I probably wouldn't have wanted to take it up any more proximal. Do you think that's too low for you for a syndesmosis screw? I mean, I don't think it's, I, you know, I, I like to have it a little bit higher. I mean, I'm yeah. talking about like a few millimeters, but I, I think, I mean, you're already putting a screw across of it. So what does it matter um, if it's a little higher or lower? I mean, you want to be, the, the closer you are, it's going to be more rigid. A couple of questions I have of this, and then in, in regards, and I'd be interested in your thoughts. And, and when you think about a fibular nail versus a plate, and then you think about using something like something flexible fixation that's got buttons on either side, and then the button resting on the bone. And sometimes you can see where my clamps are and you can see where the fracture exits it's right next to where the fracture is going to be. So then are you going to leave um, your button right on a fracture line or on a little spike of bone potentially in that distal piece? Is it going to fall into that and then be loose or is it going to fall into, you know, abut the nail? Um, some of the questions that I've had, you know, if in these, in these settings. Um, so in this case, I, I use screws, this kind of going back to that adage of, you know, somebody I didn't trust and uh, was concerned about compliance. And so I ended up using screws in this case. Um, but, you know, a lot of people use um, flexible fixation with an intermedullary nail as well. Um, thoughts on thoughts on that, Jan? Yeah, so no, well, the yeah, I, I don't know if it matters. Like, you know, when I'm using it for the patients that I, you know, high risk patients, I prefer screws because I think it's just a stronger construct. Um, you know, overall, especially, you know, patients that are diabetic or neuropathic. Uh, the question I have um, in terms of, uh, you know, you, you know, you fixed the lateral side here, but we know the deltoid was injured. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How often, and, and how often are you, when are you fixing the deltoid? Um, and how are you fixing the deltoid? So if, if they have um, a lot of widening and they're a young patient, then I probably am having a low, I'm having a lower threshold to go in and fix a deltoid. And, and, and so sometimes like in a younger person, I'll scope them and then look at the deltoid through the scope. And that can give me a pretty good indication with how disrupted it is. Some of the cases I know it is so wide. Like in this case, if this is a younger person, I'm not worried about incision problems. I'm probably fixing his deltoid. And in that case, a lot of times I'm just gonna open that medial side 
I'm going to evacuate the hematoma, look at the cartilage through my medial incision. I might not necessarily um, always scope it. Um, it. But in a younger person, athlete, that kind of thing, I'm going to scope it. I'm going to look at the cartilage and do all those things. And then I'll make a medial arthrotomy, kind of like your, you know, just right over the medial mal. Um, and then I'll put usually 90% plus of the time it's off the tibia. And I will put a single anchor. You can use two if you want, but usually one is enough. And then I can get a Mason Allen stitch into the deltoid fibers. A lot of times it's the superficial <laughs> fibers of the deltoid, and I can get a nice repair um, in that case. No, yeah, I'm, I'm similar. I'll, I'll do if I fix it with the uh, with the suture anchors. Uh, it was one more. Sorry, I got distracted there because I was reading the question here. Same here. <laughs> uh, do you see much value in locking the nail proximally? What would necessitate additional fixation within the canal? Well, this has like this little flare that comes out in this particular setting to give some, right. you know. Oh some, yeah, you can see it nicely there. You, you can see, see the there. tines. Um, but there, I think there are some others that have more different options, different proximal locking options. Um, and I'm, and I'm not hundred, I'm not, a, you know, familiar enough with all the nailing options to know exactly what those are, but potentially that would be nice to be able to, to lock it, um, proximally, but you know, that nail can only be so big. So you're, you're, you're a little limited in what you can, you know, you, what you can have to get. Um, and in, another screw, another locking screw, proximally. And right. you know, the other thing that I think I, I failed to mention before is that when I'm thinking through somebody that I'm going to do an intermedullary fibular nail, you you want to make sure that you're measuring out the diameter of the canal and know what your implant's going to be. Because there's some people out there with super narrow canals that if you try to do a fibular nail, you're probably going to um, you're probably going to potentially break the the fibula proximal or, or propagate something proximal. So just be aware of what you're using size-wise and, and look at the canal diameter if you can um, before you put a rod in. Right, and, and I think that's why some people, I mean, not some people, but some companies now have gone, you know, like you said, it, that nail has to be pretty narrow up approximately. It's very hard to uh, fix it, you know, with a screw, especially if it was guided, right? Um, because it, it just the threshold of uh, and a tolerance of, of using such a small device, uh, but also that you know some of the the other nail company now they have it so it's threaded right mm -hmm. that whole uh, that driving end of the nail is threaded like a screw so they kind of I guess lock it I'm assuming it just locks into the cortex I've not used one of theirs uh, but I, I'm assuming that's what it does for fixation yeah I mean. Yeah. There's a there's a lot. This I think there's I think you're going to see more fibular nails. I think you're going to see uh, some gaining popularity with it. I, like it, like we've kind of talked about. I think you want to make sure you stick to the same principles like anything. Get the fracture reduced. Um, some of the things that I've I've struggled I've tried to mention with already. Some of them I've run into issues, especially if not very good bone and it's hard to get it clamped and it's a little bit old anyway. Um, is is getting and maintaining length with the fibular nail. Uh, where yeah. it can end up a little bit short. And I, I've had some where it's ended up shorter than I would have liked. So those are those are some of the things I've kind of thought about uh, with it. But, you know, I talked to somebody this weekend who's nailing every fibula. Um, and so, I, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe that's, that's going to be the way. Um, and David said, if you end up removing the fibular nail, what do you use to fill the void? Easy, a plate. Put a plate on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, you don't need to put anything. As if as long as the bone is healed, you can remove the nail. Just, I mean, we remove nails all the time in tibias and femurs and, and humeruses uh, without issue. Um, so, well, yeah. without issue, I mean, like no more issue than any other hardware removal. Correct. That's what I meant. <laughs> I mean, like we don't fill it. We don't fill it. We don't. Correct. We don't fill the intramedullary canal with anything. Yeah afterwards so yeah you're right no one ever looks good taking out hard <laughs> all right well that's bringing us up to 8 30 i mean that's like two cases that we got through um if there's uh topics we'll try to do it again in february we'll kind of look at the look ahead at the schedule um and pick out a date and i'll uh, send out some reminders again thanks to everybody who got on the call um it was really 
um, fun to sit and chat. Hopefully you found this helpful. If, um, if there's a topic or something you'd like us to touch on, um, then let us know. Otherwise, we'll um, come out with a topic here in a little bit, put some cases together and, and go through some, some different things. Yeah, thanks everyone. Appreciate it, Nick. Great cases and a great, a lot of questions tonight. So that was yeah. awesome. Yeah, I love the questions. That's so much fun. That makes this much more interactive. And um, and I think that's really helpful for us and, and make sure that we're you know, hitting on the topics that y'all want to hear about. Yeah, thanks guys. Have a great night, everybody.